This is 100 Years of Cox. You are listening to a podcast by Francis Thompson. I'm telling the story of 10 siblings from the Matrel Cox family through the letters they wrote to each other. They were born in England between 1868 and 1884. Seven of them lived in England and three lived abroad in the colonies. In 1907, Dr Cox wrote an account of all the places in London where he has eaten lunch and tea. He entitles the piece London Lunches and Town Teas. Some of the places are still there, but due to the internet and maps, it is possible to work out where some of them used to be. Bernard, sibling number six, was the editor of the Christmas Budget, and in 1907, in November, he was nagging his siblings, telling them to hurry up and get their contributions into him so he can get everything ready and sent off to the printers. He relates in a budget letter how he has asked his father to contribute something, and then describes how Dr Cox dictated 20 pages of memories to him in one afternoon and evening with just a short break for tea. Poor Bernard, I can imagine the scene. Dr Cox is standing, pacing round his study, pouring sentences forth in an enthusiastic manner, probably dictating far more quickly than Bernard can cope with. Bernard is at the writing desk, scribbling frantically, using old-fashioned pen and ink, writing down his father's lengthy essay as it is dictated to him. Bernard later told his siblings how exhausted he was and how amazed he was at the amount of information his father could recall without any notes. Charlie Boy was how my grandfather, Leslie, referred to his own grandfather when Grandad Leslie was an old man. Charlie Boy, or Dr Cox, if we are being respectful, must have been quite a character. London Lunches and Town Teas December 1907 by John Charles Cox I felt it a compliment to be asked to contribute to the family Christmas budget. But I made it a condition that the editor should choose my subject. Knowing the necessary habits of my life for the last several years since we have lived near town, which oblige me for four or five days a week to take lunch and afternoon tea away from home, he suggested, without hesitation, that some account of the various places that I frequent for the purpose of satisfying an innocent appetite would be suitable. To this suggestion I acceded, for it seemed to me that my experiences might possibly be somewhat entertaining, and would certainly prove useful to others leading a like life with a limited purse. The first general reflection that occurs to me is, However did the enormous number of clerks, shop assistants of both sexes and all kinds of middle class folk, with a slight sprinkling of higher ranks, however did all these folk get lunch in town 50 or even 25 years ago? Nay, even in the last five years, the increase of respectable places for what is generally termed light refreshment has been on a startling scale. More particularly, is it difficult to understand how the fairer sex were fed in the 60s, 70s and even 80s of last century? Ladies shopping or visiting town for picture galleries, matinees, etc. had considerable difficulty and long distances to go to find any kind of place where they could get anything more than a bun of sorts or a glass of milk over the confectioner's counter. There were, of course, several places where men could get lunch, and I well remember Simpsons in the Strand in the old days, and the old house in Fleet Street at the bottom of Chancery Lane, which was then wrongly labelled in big letters, the Palace of Henry VIII and Wolsey. I also on several occasions had bread and cheese and stout luncheon at the celebrated Cheshire Cheese in an alley off Fleet Street. I used to go there with Ashton Dilk, 
at the time when I wrote for the Weekly Dispatch, of which he was the editor and the proprietor. The offices of that newspaper were then close by in Wine Office Court. I also used to get a chop sometimes at the Museum Tavern, close to the British Museum, and at one or two chop houses of that character, as they were then called. The almost invariable arrangement of these places was the dividing off into pens, with tall, straight-back, comfortless settles on which to sit, such as you see in some of the original illustrations to Charles Dickens' novels. Even larger-sized restaurants, such as I can remember being first opened, thought it right to follow this plan, although the seats were wider and the backs were not quite so high and slightly sloping, and in some cases the wood was mahogany. This was the case at the dining room of the Ludgate Hill station, which I remember being first opened, and which was then considered most luxurious. Indeed, it is only of late years, since lions have had charge of the refreshments at that station, that the last traces of the pen or pew arrangement have been cleared away. In those days, it required much bravery to ask for a cup of coffee in the middle of the day and you would have raised a laugh, and would have been absolutely refused at the chop house proper if you had asked for tea. They would give you water if you pressed for it, but it was served in a very shady-looking bottle or decanter, and was usually discoloured, whilst the face of the waiter, as he banged it on the table, was expressive of the utter contempt that he felt for your combined temperance and penury. As time went on and luxury increased, there came about the accompaniment of music to the midday meal. I fancy this first came in at the Holborn restaurant, which was certainly the first dining place that was highly embellished with marble and gilding, and for some time it stood quite by itself. The criterion was not long in following suit. In the days before I was in holy orders, I several times brought up parties of young men or boys for a day in town. In or about 1878, I remember bringing up a large, almost adult, Sunday school class from Belper, near Derby. We hired a bus for the day and did an enormous amount of sightseeing. I asked my brother Henry where we had better have a midday meal, and he said, oh, take them to the grill room of the Criterion, which had just then only been opened. I don't think they enjoyed it very much, for they were overcome with the glare and the glitter and the smartness of the waiters. We had great helpings of beefsteak, and young Williams, who was a shy lad of about 18, he used to play the harmonium for me, at services at Farner Green at Belper, while he was overcome by the size and nature of his helping. Nudging me with his elbow, he said in a whisper, do you think the gentleman would be much offended if I leave some of the fat? By the gentleman, he of course meant the waiters. But a truce to these meanderings amid the shadowy reminiscences of the past. Good, says editor. Harking back, it is really almost amazing where the fairly respectable looking people of both sexes, mostly young, come from, who crowd the cheaper form of temperance restaurants at midday, and almost as much so at five o'clock for afternoon tea. Wherever did these crowds lunch or tea before these places were opened? For instance, close to London Bridge Station, there have been two of these large places opened for certainly the last eight or nine years, namely an unusually large ABC, which of course stands for Aerated Bread Company, occupying two houses, and close by another rather cheaper, but quite as clean and really better place called the Creamery. In the borough, within a couple of hundred yards of the station, a large lion's and another ABC were opened three years ago. Within the last six months, two more very big places, immediately opposite each other, at the entrance to London Bridge Approach, have been started. One is called the Express Dairy, 
which is particularly good, and another lion's. Now, about 10 days ago, I went into both of these at about 1.20pm and I could not find a seat in either establishment. Then I turned down the borough, past an ABC, which was equally crowded, and had difficulty in finding a seat in the second lion's. Again, I ask, wherever had all these people previously had their lunch? Talking of the aerated bread company, to whom belongs the credit of inaugurating these tea shops, there isn't the least doubt that they have to some extent recently deteriorated and have been outclassed by some of their rivals. They have followed the more enterprising Lions, Express Dairy Company, etc., in providing a more varied and substantial midday meal for those who might require it. It is not so long since the only things at their places, outside the bun and pastry line, were eggs, soup or beef tea and a small variety of cold meat. Five years ago, I had difficulty in several of their shops in persuading them to provide a hot sausage. They would let you have it cold, but even when professedly hot, it was only suited to Laodiceans. Nowadays, they have a greater variety, but not so much as their rivals. They lay themselves out to provide you with China tea, if you prefer it and ask for it. But here again, they show bad management, for they don't treat you alike at all their places. A barrister friend of mine told me the other day that he was refused China tea at two of their shops, although at one of them there was a card on the wall saying China tea could indeed be had. I myself heard it asked for at their London Bridge shop about five o'clock, and the young woman said she couldn't be bothered with providing China tea for the gentlemen when they were so busy. At the same depot, and also at those close to the Victoria and Charing Cross stations, the attendants are frequently off-hand or actually uncivil. The poor girls themselves, not infrequently, look somewhat grimy, whilst the cloths with which they swab down the marble-topped little tables look sometimes as if they had also done duty in the kitchen, about the grate or the stove. On the whole, I should recommend that you avoid ABC places, particularly the larger ones, if there are any of their rivals near at hand. There does not seem to be the same general supervision which undoubtedly exists at Lyons, and the comfort or discomfort of these places undoubtedly depend on the unaproned ladies in black behind the counter, who are generally considered to be in charge. In the places where the service is slack and the attendant offhand, it may generally be noticed that much gossiping and giggling goes on between the aproned ladies and those who are supposed to be their superiors and are not similarly garnished with an apron. All the ABC depots rejoice in a particularly good and simple cake, so far as my taste goes, called Sultana cake. It is only a penny a slice. However, if you ask for Sultana cake at Lyons, they give you a musty, dry concoction, which is definitely an inferior product, and they charge you tuppence. Others, besides myself, appreciate the ABC Sultana cake. Not long since, after a council meeting of the Canterbury and York Society, I wanted to have a chat with Abbot Gasquay, and we turned into a small lion's shop. The Canterbury and York Society have not yet paid for this advertisement, writes the editor. As we sat down, the ascetic Benedictine's features assumed a bland expression, and with an engaging smile he said, I do like an excuse for coming into these places. I do like their excellent sultana cake. Shall we both have some? Oh dear! I said, I fear I dislike lion sultana cake intensely. I do not like the taste, and they charge you tuppence. Oh, came the reply, is this not an ABC? And looking round, and seeing no attendant nearby, he said, let us fly, and we fled. 
the young woman, at the receipt of custom by the door, thought we were escaping without payment. She shouted to us to stop and vainly tried to grab at us as we hastened by. We left her with her fingers entangled in the network of brass wire, which is intended, I suppose, to prevent assaults on her till from the outside. About four doors lower down that street is an ABC, which we entered with some haste. There we revelled in penny portions of sultana cake, and the possible greed of the head of all the Benedictines in England and America was surely atoned for by the thrift that he practised. The greatest variety of cheap lunches can be found at the Express Dairy Company depot, of which there are several in the neighbourhood of the British Museum, and they are gradually growing in other parts. When I have been at the British Museum, I frequently seek lunch in the area. Slater's restaurants are good, but just a trifle higher in price, however, with more refinements. The cabin restaurants are more showy and flighty than some of the other establishments. They are the only ones where the young women seem slightly disposed to be larky. They have a more frivolous form of cap, and their aprons are bedecked round the edge with a superabundance of cheap machine-made lace, which probably comes from Edmund's Arcadia of Long Eaton. There used to be one rather attractive-looking cabin restaurant in Fleet Street, and when I was at the public record office, I occasionally went there for my lunch. There was a certain amount of apparent flightiness among the young ladies there, so indeed I naturally tried to be particularly reserved and closely engaged in the study of my newspaper. Naughty, comments the editor. In fact, I never went to that particular cabin restaurant without calling to mind that crushing remark of son number two when he said at Porlock, Father, did you ever have any dignity? But on the occasion of my last visit to that particular restaurant, for it soon afterwards closed, my dignity fled entirely and I was dissolved into laughter. I am afraid of a somewhat noisy sort. I was just going to consume my portion when I found something tickling my wrist. I looked down and saw that my triangularly disposed tablecloth for cabin restaurants pride themselves on providing you with small tablecloths, was surrounded with starched, machine-made lace. This fancy decorative edge was bothering me. My attendant was just passing, and I called her attention to this, saying, You are getting very extravagant here, but I much prefer a plain tablecloth. She looked down and declared, Oh dear, why, this is my clean apron which I have been looking for everywhere. It is somewhat interesting to note, however, the general silence of these places, or, at all events, the quite subdued tone of conversation, even amongst friends at the same table. In some such places, mostly, I think, lions, as in the big cheap room on the right-hand side of Ludgate Hill Station, there is an abundance of provision for playing draughts or dominoes, the latter by preference. In this particular room, from about one thirty until close upon two o'clock, the dominoes on the bare marble tables make a continuous noisy clatter, producing curious sounds that at one time puzzled me as I passed by on the street. The clerks and the shop boys often have an hour for dinner, and it seems rather a good thing that they should use half this time at all events in wet or wintry weather, in playing such games. Generally these games take place in the part where smoking is allowed. Why, I don't know, but I have never seen girls playing games anywhere, just clerks and shop boys. At one time I went pretty regularly at midday into Lyons, just opposite the Holborn restaurant, which is very much frequented by young people of the shop or warehouse class. The extra large room downstairs is where smoking is permissible. Here there used to be always a minority of the fairer sex, although not smoking. On one occasion here I once saw the only bit of rudeness 
I ever noticed towards a girl. Four girls were seated at one table. Close by, indeed almost touching them, was a table of young men. One of the young men turned round to the girl immediately behind him and said out loud, Well, miss, I've seen you here pretty regularly for the last week or two, and I hope you enjoy our smoke. She simply stared at him, whereupon he offered her a cigarette and said, Won't you join us? She was still silent, and then he said, Haven't you got a tongue? Oh, yes, was the response, and I'm going to use it at once in reporting your bad manners to the manager. And she hurried off upstairs, I believe, to report him. It was in the same room in Holborn that I was spoken to by a fellow mealer, the only time that I've ever been directly accosted. On this occasion, it was a pleasant looking youth who lighted a cigarette directly he had finished his meal and then leant across the table, and in a confidential way asked me if I thought he was too young to smoke. It came out in subsequent conversation that he had just turned 17, he was at school in the city, and he was a Jew, and he thought a clergyman would never mind being asked a question of that sort. I do find, on occasion, that I become involved in an interesting conversation, due in part, no doubt, to my clerical attire. One word or so as to special dishes. My most common lunch is a cup of coffee and a couple of poached eggs. At Express Dairies they also scramble them very well. The Express Dairy have recently started a large and airy depot in Hart Street where they have a larger menu than I think elsewhere. It varies not a little day by day. You can frequently get good grilled kidneys and bacon. They have often fairly tasty dishes of fish, grilled mackerel, for example. Lions and others have small steak and kidney puddings, which are good. A satisfying and well-flavoured dish at Lions in the winter is scotch broth, which is only fourpence. I have now and again tried mutton chops at different places, and they vary exceedingly. But at any rate, a mutton chop or loin at any decent restaurant is invariably better than one supplied at a private house. Why is this? I know not. Has anyone ever partaken of thoroughly good beefsteak in a private house? I am sure I haven't. But to return to our mutton, I can name four places where they are exceedingly good. The restaurant room of the First Avenue Hotel in Holborn. Lions at Ludgate Hill Station, the restaurant room at Euston Station, and the much cheaper British tea table places. At least I've tried two British tea table shops where the chops have been good and nicely served. Some of these BTT places get overcrowded at times and are perhaps not quite desirable, but personally I would rather go to a BTT on the whole than to an ABC bank clerks and a good many other of the superior clerk grade seem to like buffet lunches where you sit up on a high stool at a counter and are very liable to have your eatables or your drinkables chucked about by the elbows of your neighbours as the stools are placed very close together. In the part of London that I frequent the most the two most popular of this style of lunch are the very long buffet at the Holborn and the double one at the First Avenue. A shy man might feel somewhat embarrassed by the very close propinquity to the barmaids, but all the same, they seem to do such a rapid business from one until two, that the habitués seem to have no time but for the curtest of greetings. I have been on a few occasions to each of these, and I think they seem to me most frequented by regular customers. Many of them directly they mount their stools, say, Good morning, Miss Jones, or whatever her name is. Miss Jones's frequent reply is, Same as usual, I suppose. Or, if she is very busy, she might just say, The usual? Of these two places, I think the First Avenue give you rather the better food and a little more room.
but it was there that I saw an accident, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I only wish it had been on a more extended scale, which might easily have been the case, if it hadn't occurred when the lunchtime rush was getting slack. An elderly gentleman was sitting on my right, and he insisted on keeping his umbrella between his knees and balancing a small handbag over the handle. When he dismounted from his stool, he lost his balance and he fell over, fortunately not on my side. He rolled on the floor with his stool and he succeeded in completely upsetting his neighbour from his stool, as well as scattering the contents of the plate of the man next but one to him. So far as I recollect, there was, strange to say, no bad language. But the man next but one to the old gentleman loudly insisted on his food being painful, the mutton and potatoes being all on the floor or on the counter. It was most entertaining indeed. As to Lyon's popular lunch, which costs one shilling and sixpence, with its music and marble halls in Piccadilly, I need say nothing but only warn the unwary that it is generally crowded from one till two, especially in the season. If you want elbow room there, you should make up your mind to eat your lunch at 12.30 or at two. But on Saturdays, you can generally get a place at all times. Wednesdays are the most crowded because of people coming up to matinees. Before long, Lions will have a similar place ready at Exeter Hall in the Strand. It must not be supposed, however, that Lyons were the first to start a satisfactory one shilling and six lunch of several good courses. For many years there has been a very good restaurant providing this, but not music, at the lower end of Regent Street on the Piccadilly side. There are at least two of a good character in Oxford Street between Moody's and Tottenham Court Road Corner but in all these, the waiters expect a small tip. I can pretty strongly recommend the Vienna restaurant, a large corner house close to Moody's, where New Oxford Street and Hart Street divide. This big restaurant of several floors provides a great number of German dishes and all forms of German and Austrian cakes and pastry. It is, of course, a good deal frequented by foreigners, and upstairs there is a great variety of continental newspapers. But they do a good deal of English cooking, and on the ground floor many of their lunch customers are English. The charges are fairly moderate. They generally have on the menu two or three styles of curry, which they serve with an abundance of excellently cooked rice. Curried prawns are a speciality of theirs. The drawback is that Germans are not particularly nice neighbours at a restaurant, especially when of the petticoated sex. This Vienna restaurant has a charming variety of bread rolls, several of which generally stand on a large plate on each table. Not long since, when I was lunching there, at a table on the opposite side of the central passage, two German females sat down for lunch. Whilst waiting for their order, one of them crossed over to my table and, removing a much soiled glove, proceeded, with fingers to which a like epithet might fairly be applied, to prod and handle freely the selection of bread rolls on my table. Not approving of any of them, she went back to her own table. I had tried in vain to bring a blush to her unfair cheek by staring at her in a marked way whilst she was engaged in the finger testing of the breads before me. I therefore lifted up my plate of bread rolls and carried them across to her table, presenting them with as good a bow as the nature of my shape and the age to which I have attained would permit. The ladies tried their best to produce grateful smiles and nods of appreciation and expressed in a guttural mixture of German and English their obligations to me for my politeness, assuring me that they did not care for or want any of my bread. With a stern look and a certain amount of dignity, if only Arthur will believe it, I explained that in England we didn't like our food being handled by others 
and that they would much oblige me by retaining it all. They looked bewildered, but I returned to my seat and I called loudly to the waiter, suggesting quite audibly that the ladies should pay for the bread they had fingered. There was much sensation and whispering at the other tables, but I did not look up and I proceeded to read my Westminster Gazette. This advertisement is also unpaid for, says the editor. As to the very occasional indulgence in a more costly lunch with a friend or friends, I need say nothing here. I have heard folks say that the Trocadero lunch, costing three shillings and sixpence, is supposed to be very good, but I've only been there once. I'm glad to say that I've also only been once to the Prince's restaurant in Piccadilly, where I paid two and six for a small basin of green pea soup. I have no desire to return to that establishment. The Frascati two shilling and sixpence lunch is excellent and the music ditto. It is always better to take a table in the gallery when you visit there. Both menu and music are considered better there than at the Holborn restaurant, although they're both under the same proprietors. A final word. I have never yet with the hundreds of eggs I've had served to me in London restaurants, partaken of one which was the least atom doubtful. And I've almost invariably found the coffee excellent, but I cannot say quite the same of the tea. John Charles Cox. <laughs> Notes on Dr Cox's letter. It is hard to know where to start. There is so much rich detail in this letter. Dr Cox wrote a lot of books, historical, religious and also some travel books. And by 1900 he had retired from the church, was living in Sydenham in South London and he spent a great deal of time doing research. This was why he was regularly in central London. He would have visited the public records office the Church Times newspaper, the Athenaeum Club, the British Museum and his publishers. I didn't know that the British Museum would also lend books out, an extraordinary idea to us today, but presumably they only loaned out their books to respectable and trustworthy people. The ABC stands for the Aerated Bread Company, a chain of tea shops which has now completely disappeared. Although a couple continue ghost-like, a part of London's history. On one old shop, the painted name of ABC is visible on the brickwork of the shop, with the brightly coloured modern sign of Tesco below. I will find a photo of one and put it on Twitter. Lion's Corner Stores, probably a more well-known name. Lion's Tea, Lion's Made Ice Cream, Lion's Cakes. These are names which continued after the tea shops disappeared. An interesting fact about Lyons is that one of their factories secretly made a substantial percentage of the UK's World War II bombs, when everyone thought the Lyons factories were still just making cakes. The other interesting fact is that the family were Jewish, but they chose Lyons, a British-sounding name instead, for obvious racial reasons. The Lions Corner Stores were huge establishments in central London, much grander than the simple Lions tea shops. The corner stores were in the centre of London, each with several themed restaurants inside, catering for different tastes and serving food to hundreds of people at a time. The waitresses were known as nippies, and working as a nippy was considered very good training before becoming a housewife. Statements that will make your eyebrows rise today. The Trocadero restaurant, known as the Troc, this was another popular restaurant, which was also owned by the Lions Group. Vera and her hockey friends regularly had dinner there after Kent hockey matches, and later Vera also celebrates there with the England team after their international matches at Richmond. Prince Henry's room is at 17 Fleet Street, it is an ancient timber building. It is one of the few medieval buildings which survived the Great Fire of London in 1666. 
If you look up Prince Henry's room, Fleet Street, online, you will find it. It was formerly the carriageway entrance to the Temple Church. Prince Henry's room is on the first floor, and the ground floor has a long history as a tavern. It was clearly somewhere where Dr Cox enjoyed his lunch. When Dr Cox wrote this letter, or rather, when he dictated all his lunch memories to Bernard, who scribbled it all down, there was indeed a painted sign on the building, declaring it to be formerly the palace of Henry VIII and Cardinal Wolsey. Dr Cox is quite correct. It wasn't. There are photos online. I will find one and put it on Twitter. Fleet Street is, however, a very old part of London. The Temple Church is adjacent. Matilda went here on her sightseeing carriage ride in 1827. The Middle Temple and the Inner Temple are two of the historic four inns of court. They are surrounded by gardens, a place of history, wealth and great privilege. Matilda and Mrs Maester, in their carriage in 1827, either passed through the carriage entrance way at number 17 Fleet Street, where Prince Henry's room is, or they went through the equally small carriageway entrance into Middle Temple Lane further along Fleet Street. You can find all these places using maps, choosing satellite view. The Cheshire Cheese is another old London tavern, which also dates back to the Great Fire of London. It is on the corner of Fleet Street and Wine Office Court, just like Dr Cox says. I found it using street view and maps. In one of Agatha Christie's novels, Hercule Poirot has a meeting there. Dr Cox clearly liked having a lunch of bread, cheese and beer in the Cheshire Cheese more than 100 years ago when he was meeting up with his friends. Dr Cox also liked a lunch of hot sausages, which he could get in an ABC tea shop. And he says, even when professedly hot, it was only suited to Laodiceans. I knew there was something to do with Laodicea in the book of Revelation, but I had to check with clergy who know their Bibles better than I do. The writer of Revelation is not very impressed with the ancient Laodicean church. They were half-hearted and lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. Apparently, they had built an aqueduct so they could get ice-cold water down from the mountains. But by the time it reached the city, the water was warm. There were also hot springs, but by the time this water reached the city, it was also lukewarm. Hence, the people of the ancient Laodicean church were known for being neither hot nor cold. It is a biblical joke. The writer of Revelation is mocking the ancient church. Dr Cox would no doubt have found this humorous, comparing his lunchtime sausages to the Laodicean church. But the entertaining thing is that Dr Cox doesn't see any need to explain his joke in his letter. His ten children evidently knew their Bibles well. I had never heard of Moody's before, so I looked it up. It was a lending library. This one was close to the British Museum, one of the regular haunts of Dr Cox although Moody operated establishments in other locations as well. He was enormously successful. By 1890, Moody's had over 25,000 subscribers. People would pay their subscription and their selection of books would be delivered to them. They didn't even need to visit Moody's in person. This meant Moody had great influence over the publishers. If he considered a book to be immoral, he wouldn't stock it and the fate of that particular book would be sealed. Only the wealthy could access library books, due to the cost of subscription. Novels were also expensive, and most people couldn't afford to buy them. This was another reason why magazines, such as The Strand, were very popular. Books would be published in serial form, a chapter at a time, in magazines like The Strand. The Sherlock Holmes books are one such example. Dr Cox was definitely a bit of a snob. He liked the waitresses to wear plain aprons, and preferably clean ones, and he found lacy aprons distasteful. But it is quite entertaining to hear his opinions on the merits of handmade lace compared to machine-manufactured lace. Edmund, his eldest son, lived near Long Eaton in Derbyshire, and Dr Cox disdainfully assumes that this is where the inferior machine-manufactured lace will have come from. 
and Dr Cox's story about cleanliness at the Vienna restaurant, the dirty gloves, the dirty fingers handling the bread, and his indignation. We wouldn't put up with it today, either, although we would accuse Dr Cox of being racist. Surely English ladies had dirty gloves and dirty fingers in the early 1900s as well. Who knows? Another question I would ask Dr Cox if I had a time machine. My favourite story from this letter has to be the one about Dr Cox and Abbot Francis Gasquet, the Benedictine, preferring ABC Sultana cake, which only cost a penny, rather than the lion's version, which cost tuppence and didn't taste as good. It is fascinating what you can find out online. I looked up Abbot Gasquet and he was indeed working in London and he was the Abbot President of the English Benedictines in 1907. He was later made a cardinal and moved to Rome, where he became the archivist of the Vatican secret archives. I am picturing the abbot, no doubt in Benedictine robes, and Dr Cox, who always dressed in his clergyman's black, even on his summer holidays. Let us fly, says the Benedictine, and the two of them dash out of Lyon's tea shop, heading for an ABC instead. They are not young men, they are both in their sixties and the waitress yells out, thinking they are leaving without paying. Coffee and tea. It is always interesting to hear about where you can get good coffee and tea. I am a tea drinker, and I quite agree with Dr Cox. I have had some terrible cups of tea served to me, although I probably shouldn't say where. This letter makes me want to wander about the streets of central London, finding all the places Dr Cox talks about. But, failing that, Almost all the places and streets he mentions can be found online if you are interested in browsing the history of London's tea shops. In the next episode of 100 Years of Cox, I will read a letter by Edmund sibling number two, about the Zeppelin air raid in 1916 when 23 bombs were dropped on the small community of Hallam Fields in Derbyshire in one night. One of the bombs lands on Edmund's church and the letter is full of fascinating detail. I was going to include Edmund's letter in this episode but that would have made it a long episode. After that we will rejoin the Machel Cox family budget in June 1907, as they are looking forward to their summer holiday at Studland Bay in Dorset. There is also plenty of discussion and planning for the bicycling tour, which will take place in September 1907. Neville has managed to get them all organised. I was sent some photos this week from Street View of the Cox family home, which was at 13 Longton Avenue in Sydenham, next to Wells Park, If you are listening in London, I'd love some more photos of the house, especially if someone is brave enough to knock on the front door. There are a lot of listeners in Australia and the UK, so hello to all of you. Hello also to the listeners in the United States, Hong Kong, Belgium and Luxembourg. And if you live in the Caribbean, greetings to you from Australia, as someone is listening to 100 Years of Cox in the Dominican Republic. Machel Cox Letters is on Twitter, where I share photos from the budget, as well as the sketches drawn by Avis. Or you can send me an email, machelcoxletters at gmail.com. You have been listening to 100 Years of Cox. Thank you for listening. (laughs) 